Hi, welcome to the first of the online lectures for Moral Dimensions 650. I'm Professor Levine. This is the first time I'm recording one of these, so please bear with me with any snags, hiccups, or ums and ahs as I'm trying to give the lecture straight to my computer screen alone in my home, as opposed to in front of a crowd of rapt students hanging on my every word. I'd like to start with utilitarianism for moral dimensions, in part because if you've been looking at policy at all, it probably will be fairly familiar to you. And also in part because, frankly, utilitarianism is one of the simplest theories that we're going to be looking at uh, over the course of the semester. So what I'll be doing in this little lecture is talking a little bit to start about some of the broad issues with how we frame moral decisions and the different kinds of ways that we might frame moral decisions. A little bit about where that fits in with the kind of thinking you might do as a policy person, and then of course get to what it says on the tin, utilitarianism, and explain a bit about what makes utilitarianism distinctive, why it might be an attractive theory, why it might be an unattractive theory, and that sort of thing. All right, so in a sense, and this is a gross, gross oversim oversimplification, but in a sense you can think of moral theory, the practice of thinking systematically and philosophically about ethics and morality, as really trying to grapple with three big questions. And they're big questions that have two interesting aspects. One is that they tend to be interrelated, and the other is that as a result of that, they tend to be sort of mashed together in our normal, everyday moral thinking. Really what the situation is, is that in our everyday moral thinking, we consider all of these things, uh, sometimes rather haphazardly, and philosophers hate that. We're really, really focused on getting everything absolutely rigorously defined, or, well, most philosophers are. Uh, if you are interested, you can ask me about particularism later, and I will yammer at you for a couple of hours. But most philosophers are interested in, in regularizing this, and not for no reason. The main reason is that the concern is if you approach morality with a kind of non-prioritized, haphazard concern for all of these aspects of moral decisions, they're often in tension and you won't have a clear way of resolving the tensions that might arise between them. So anyway, the three questions are, as uh, you should be seeing on your, on your screen right now, when you're looking at some kind of decision, whether an individual decision about what to do today, or whether a policy decision about what kind of rule or practice or law or policy or administrative code to adopt, there are three kinds of questions you might ask about it. The first is, what would be the best outcome in this situation? What do we want to accomplish? What would be a good thing to come out of my decision? The second slightly different one is, what is the right thing to do? Are there rules or principles that guide my action here that I ought not transgress? Uh, so you can clearly see the distinction between these two kinds of uh, concerns. For instance, take something like the debate about torture that had gone on, has been going on in the U.S. since at least September 11th. On the one hand, now, of course, you do have some people who say, look, torture is just wrong and it also doesn't work. But a lot of the interesting and acrimonious debate has gone on between two camps that don't accept that kind of reconciling perspective on torture. On the one hand, you have some people saying, look, at least in some cases, maybe they're unusual, maybe they're rare, but in some cases, ticking time bomb kinds of cases, maybe you have to torture people for the greater good. We torture this one guy and we save pick your favorite Kiefer Sutherland scenario. We save Paris from being leveled with a nuclear weapon. 
And other people say, well, no, it's it's just it's it's just wrong. Even if you could accomplish some sort of grand good outcome by torturing someone, it's simply wrong to to do it. And if anything, this kind of tension can be more pronounced in less extreme kinds of cases. Reasonable people can disagree, for instance, about whether some kind of taxation, even though it might not be in any obvious sense fair, uh, might be justified for the greater good. This is the kind of argument that libertarians and uh, liberals are having about the health care reform debate right now as I'm recording this. Is the government allowed to force me to purchase health care insurance, even if I don't want to, on the grounds that this will somehow promote the greater good for everyone? Okay. Those are in some sense the the questions that come up most obviously and most commonly in policy debates. But moral philosophers, and I think to some extent in policy we come up we, we, we see this too, though perhaps a little bit less often, sometimes focus on a third aspect of the question, which is uh, what is a good person like? What would a good person do? in this kind of situation. Um, a focus on character. So again, this is a little bit different from either of the other the other two foci. Um, if you're worried about what would a good person do, then you're concerning yourself with things like, what does it mean to be honest? And what would the honest person do in this situation? And that, or what does it mean to be courageous? And that may be distinct from either being the courageous person is the one who you know, is the person who does whatever gets the greatest good without concern for personal risk. Or being a courageous person is the one who follows the rules all the time without concern for personal risk. Uh, some people think that there is a separate question of character that is not reducible easily to these other kinds of approaches. So like I said, in everyday life, most of us are concerned with all three of these aspects of moral decision making, though often in a somewhat haphazard manner. Sometimes what seems to loom largest is the consequences. Sometimes what seems to loom largest are the rules. And sometimes what seems to loom largest are decisions about the kind of person that we would like to be. The problem, to get back to the problem, the problem, because that sounds pretty reasonable, the problem is that when these things come into conflict, if we don't have a theory about how they relate, we might be left without much guidance. Uh, when following the rules seems to lead to a very bad outcome, if you don't have a view about which is more important to your moral life, you might be left in a kind of quandary without any clear way out. And of course, the deeper problem for philosophers is that we just, we're just offended by this kind of non-systematicity sometimes. It seems um, in something like morality, maybe we ought to be a little bit more careful than just saying, well, you know, today the rules seemed like the most important thing. Um, okay, so there are three families of theories that philosophers have come up with that each focus on one aspect of moral questions. Consequentialist theories, as the name implies, focus on the outcomes. They focus on what will happen as a result of your decision or a result of the policy. Consequentialist theories say that the right thing to do is the one that brings about the best outcome. Uh, and they tend to understand the other two questions in terms of outcomes. So for a typical consequentialist, the rule says, do whatever the right thing, do whatever will get the best consequences. Uh, sometimes do whatever will typically get the best consequences. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, and a good person is someone whose actions typically promote the best consequences. Deontological theories, uh, this is a fancy name for rule-based 
if I'm remembering my ancient Greek correctly, which I am almost certainly not remembering my ancient Greek correctly, uh, this comes from uh, the Greek diantos, uh, obligation. These sorts of theories focus on the rules. Uh, deontological theories typically hold that there is some set of absolute rules and that morality primarily consists in following those rules. Uh, so a deontological thinker might say, look, don't lie. Kant famously said this. Don't lie is simply an absolute rule. It does not matter what the consequences of lying are. It doesn't matter if lying in this case would help a lot of people and harm no one. Lying is simply wrong. Uh, and similar to consequentialists, deontological theorists uh, will typically understand um, the other two questions in terms of rules. The good person is simply the one who follows the rules. Some deontologists... now. I made it sound as if deontologists don't care about consequences, and to some extent that's true, but usually deontological theories have some place for consequences, though again one that is conditioned by their focus on rules. On the one hand, many deontological theorists hold that once you have followed all the rules, you might still want to look at the consequences of the remaining permissible actions. Because rules are tend to be absolute for deontologists, they also tend to focus on rules that don't completely determine our moral life. So deontological theorists might tell you, look, don't lie, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, um, but that still leaves a pretty broad selection of choices for you in your life. A deontological theory will typically not tell you anything about whether you ought to focus on environmental policy as a career or whether you ought to go into business or become a philosophy professor. Uh, to some extent, some deontologists say, well, all right, you know, if it's not covered by the rules, do whatever you want. Uh, others will say, well, at least some things, if it's not covered by the rules, you might want to look at some of the outcomes. And a lot of deontological theorists will back up their view by even saying that we should understand outcomes to some extent in terms of the rules. Uh, so, for instance, well, there are simply, there are lots of kinds of states of affairs in the world that we understand in terms of the way we got there. Uh, for instance, take issues of life and death. We often pretty intuitively think that there's a big difference between someone dying because they were murdered, or someone dying because they were killed in a war, or someone dying because they had a disease that was not cured, even though it was curable. This kind of distinction is actually quite central to the way that most of us live our lives. <clears throat> it's a very typical thing for uh, philosophers, Peter Singer uh, is famous for bringing this kind of example up, to say, look, most of us think nothing of spending $15 on a Depeche Mode CD, and I will I will have to change this lecture soon because pretty soon no one will either remember who Depeche Mode were or ever remember what the heck a CD was. But uh, there were these things, CDs, they usually cost about $15 back in the olden times, and most of us don't think that you'd be an evil person for buy, spending $15 on a Depeche Mode CD. There are plenty of diseases uh, especially in the developing world, that a cure for one person could be purchased for roughly that amount of money, um, if not even cheaper. Singer, again, he's fond of pointing out how ludicrously cheap certain kinds of deaths are to prevent. Uh, people die of dehydration related to things like cholera in the developing world all the time. And you can block dehydration with salt pills, and salt pills are, are dirt cheap. You could buy a, a, a zillion salt pills for that 
uh, Depeche Mode CD. All right. So most of us don't think you're evil. You know, they might think you have bad taste in music, but they don't think you're evil if you buy your $15 Depeche Mode CD. On the other hand, if someone said, look, uh, Professor Levine, here's $15. I would like you to kill that guy. Um, I would probably, I would probably say, it depends, if Depeche Mode had a really good CD out, I might, but probably I would say no. And if I took the $15 to kill someone, most of you listening to this would probably have absolutely no hesitation to say that I'm a very bad person. Well, this bespeaks a kind of deontological perspective. The deontologist will say, look, even in, even when we're thinking about good and bad outcomes in the world, we often intuitively judge them differently depending on how we got there. We judge it as a great evil if someone has killed someone for $15. We do not judge it as a great evil uh, if someone has allowed someone to die when they could have prevented that death for $15. Okay. Lastly, uh, virtue theories. Virtue theories are the ones that focus on character. They're, they're traditionally associated with Aristotle. And virtue theories focus in on the exemplar of the good person. Uh, they often literally look to exemplars. Virtue theorists will often literally uh, ask you to keep in mind the image of someone who you think is a good person when you're making moral decisions. Um, Aristotle was pre-Jesus may have had some quibbles with the whole humility thing, but uh, folks who wear the what would Jesus do bracelets, these are, this is very much in line with a virtue theory of ethics. And they understand consequences and rules in terms of what it is to be a good person. The rules that you should follow are the rules that the good person would follow. The consequences that you should bring about are the states of affairs that, that a good person would value and find congenial. Now, this may not seem as obviously relevant to policy thinking as the other two kinds of theories, but keep in mind at least two things. One is that we often treat our politicians this way. Uh, when people are critical of, you know, Newt Gingrich for having 317 wives, or when people are critical of Bill Clinton for getting up to shenanigans with interns, typically, it's not the actual offense that's that big a deal, right? We voted for Bill Clinton in order to run a large nation state. We didn't vote for Bill Clinton because we cared about the state of his marriage or what he did with his pants, right? But, yes, yeah, so you might say, and a lot of people who were supporters of Bill Clinton did say, look, all right, so he's not a great guy. I don't know if I'd let him date my daughter, but who cares that much what he gets up to, the, gets up to with the interns as long as it's consensual and that sort of thing, right? Other people would say, well, well no. Someone who would abuse his power in that kind of venal, personal way might is also the kind of person that we can't trust to wield other kinds of power. If he's willing to abuse his position as president to sleep with interns, then, you know, he might be willing to use his position as president, abuse his position as president to harm the country in some more substantial way. So we do, in fact, concern ourselves with this a lot of the time, uh, and it's not insane to do so. The other side is, you know, a lot of you, you're, we're going to write memos and you're going to look at things from the grand perspective sometimes of what would be the best policy to adopt in the abstract. But the reality is a lot of what goes on in policy is people trying to do their jobs. Uh, and professionalism, a concept of what it means to be a good professional of a type, is often an important part of that. And that's essentially a virtue concept. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's essentially a virtue concept. This is perhaps clearest uh, in some of the cases that I happen to look at in cases of the military, where there are rules and there are orders to follow but to a large extent, modern militaries are held together by concepts of professionalism, by concepts of what a military professional would do. 
And in fact, we rely on them to focus on this precisely because there are many situations that cannot be anticipated properly by the rules. Uh, this is true of the military and the chaotic situation on the battlefield. It's often true of uh, bureaucrats within the government structure. You will be called on to make judgment calls. Uh, you will, and very often this will be tied in with the notion of what it is to be a good professional of the kind that you are. Okay, uh, that was fairly long-winded. Hopefully that will be some of the most abstract philosophy that we do this semester. But that's just to give you a sense of what the, the very broad landscape of ethics looks like. Now, within that, there are all sorts of variations on these theories. These are really families of theories rather than theories themselves. There are uh, relatively... Uh, don't want to say minor, relatively minority views that are dissenters from this kind of breakdown. I briefly mentioned there are particularists. I can bore you about that. Uh, there are care ethicists, um, who some of whom I reject this as sort of the exhaustive picture of morality. But this, these are the big three, um, and this is kind of the overall global picture of what moral, where moral theories break down. Um, Okay, so utilitarianism. I promised today we would actually talk about utilitarianism, so let's get to it. Uh, utilitarianism is a con consequentialist theory. It is far from the only consequentialist theory. Uh, it's the only consequentialist theory for the moment that we're going to talk about, because in a lot of ways it's the dominant one, it's the most popular one, it's the most straightforward one, um, but keep in mind it's not the only one. All right, so what is utilitarianism? few basic ideas mark your theory as a utilitarian one. And again, utilitarianism is really, in a lot of ways, a family of theories. There are different varieties of it, uh, rather than one single thing. Not all utilitarians agree on everything, but this is more or less what they agree on. First, as I mentioned, it's a consequentialist theory. For utilitarians, morality is about getting the best results. The second is, it's a monist theory, and this is actually where it differs from many of the non-utilitarian families. The only thing for a utilitarian, the only thing that counts when you're wondering whether a result is good, is the amount of utility uh, that is brought about by the decision. We'll talk about what utility is. It turns out to be complicated. but. What utilitarians are committed to is that every other good thing in the universe can be reduced to a single standard of utility. So for instance, um, if you understand utility as pleasure, what you're going to say is, is, look, there are all sorts of wonderful things in the world. A baby's smile, the Mona Lisa, a delicious meal, peace, money, uh, scientific discovery. All of these things are wonderful, but fundamentally what makes them good is how much pleasure that they create in the world. Uh, scientific discoveries are good because they bring people pleasure. Smiling babies are good because they bring people pleasure. Uh, and so everything is reduced to one standard, whether that's pleasure or money or something else. Utilitarian theories are also egalitarian. Everyone's utility counts the same. So there's no such thing on a utilitarian theory, uh, at least directly, of saying, well, people in my nation state, when I make policy decisions, I count the preferences uh, and the good of people in my nation state more than that of others. I count the good of the aristocracy more than that of others. I count the good of people of my race more than that of others. Uh, the central utilitarian ideal in a lot of ways is that all count for one and none for more than one. And when utilitarianism, at least in its modern form, was emerging, this was actually one of the more radical ideas that it brought with it. Early utilitarian thinkers were in a lot of ways reacting against understandings of morality and politics that had privileged groups against understandings that said, look, if you're a member of the nobility, you have a right to rule. 
uh, if you're a member of the nobility, what you want counts for more than other, pe other people's wants. So util it's important to utilitarians that everybody counts equally. And the only variation in this is whether looking to one person's preferences especially might help more people overall. You don't give someone what she wants just because she's a doctor and doctors count more. You might give a doctor what she wants in preference to somebody else because keeping the doctors happy lets them heal more people and makes everybody better off in the long run. Many utilitarians are in fact even more radical than counting all people equally. A lot of utilitarians have been strong defenders of animal rights, for instance. If you understand utility in a way that animals possess it, right? So again, going back to pleasure, for instance. If you understand utility as being about pleasure, well, animals feel pleasure and pain too. So many utilitarians will say, not only should we be radically egalitarian among human beings, we should be radically egalitarian among all creatures that can have the kind of utility or disutility that we're concerned with. Um, so uh, if, you, if you want to be a radical animal rights crusader, you will find many friends among the utilitarians. And finally, and this, uh, um, it's a little bit of a kludge for me to say that it's all utilitarians uh, who hold this, but this is the, the typical way of understanding utilitarianism, is that it's a maximizing theory. Uh, once you know what we mean by good on the utilitarian theory, and once you know that the scope is you're going to count everyone, well, the question is, how do you understand what kind of outcome is better than a different than another kind of outcome? And the typical idea is that, well, what you do is you aggregate everyone's utility. You take all the pleasure or all the money or all of the happiness and you add it up. And uh, the right outcome, the right thing to do is the one that gets you the, the highest total when you add all of that up. OK, so that's the basics. Like I said, there are varieties of utilitarianism, and some of these are important for policy. Um, in fact, one of the biggest debates about the status of economics that comes up in policy circles is over the definition of utility that economics uses. That's essentially the core of, of some of the, the important debates. Okay, historically, utilitarian theories have really fallen into four categories in terms of what they mean by this word utility or by goodness. Uh, again, there are variations within this, um, but the main way in which utilitarian theories have differed is on their definition of the good, and there are really four camps they've fallen into. The first is what's uh, often called hedonistic utilitarianism. Doesn't mean that it endorses hedonism in the lay sense, what it means is that hedonistic utilitarians understand utility to mean pleasure and disutility is pain. So if you want to know what is the best outcome, you look at all the pleasure that people would get uh, on some outcome of a decision. You look at all the pain that would be inflicted on people, subtract the pain from the pleasure and that's how much, uh, how much utility you have. Uh, Famously pure hedonistic utilitarians like uh, Jeremy Bentham have rejected the idea that there's any distinction in quality between different kinds of pleasures. So uh, Bentham would say, look, there's, there's nothing inherently different or more worthy about the pleasure that you get from scientific discovery versus the pleasure that you get from eating delicious hot dogs. Bentham and a lot of the hedonistic utilitarians will say the only difference and the reason why a lot of people are inclined to say, well, you know, scientific discovery is wonderful, but eating delicious hot dogs, eh, I mean, you know, it's not evil, but why should we care about that? has to do with the relationship between different kinds of pleasures. So uh, for instance, for Bentham, uh, eating was a prime example of this uh, because it was not what he called a fecund pleasure, which meant it didn't lead to 
more pleasures in the future. The idea is that if you make one scientific discovery, you get pleasure from that. And this also opens up even more possibilities for additional scientific discoveries from which you can get pleasure. The pleasure of scientific discovery builds on itself. The pleasure of philosophical reflection builds on itself. The pleasure of helping others builds on itself. By contrast, the, the pleasures of eating uh, tend to be diminishing returns. You know, I eat one hot dog. Uh, if, if you are one of the animal rights uh, activists who are attracted to, uh, to utilitarianism for that reason, imagine these are delicious vegan hot dogs, right? So I eat one delicious vegan hot dog. Um, and yeah, that's, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm happy. Uh, you know, I, I eat two, I'm a big guy, so I eat two delicious vegan hot dogs. And you know, that's, that's, that's pretty good too. You know, now I'm happy and I'm full. I'm pretty satisfied. That's great. Well, I eat three delicious vegan hot dogs and uh, it's not so bad, but you know, I probably think, oh man, I, I shouldn't have had that third delicious vegan hot dog, delicious as it was. I eat 10 hot dogs and you know, now my stomach hurts and I'm really feeling bad about myself. I've busted my diet, all sorts of stuff. So the problem is not the pleasure from the individual hot dog. The problem is that the more of them I eat, the less pleasure I can get from them. Okay. Other folks, famously Mill, thought that this was not enough, that there was something more fundamentally different between the pleasures of intellectual reflection and the pleasures of food or sex or um, warm sunlight, basically all of the pleasures that animals also feel. Uh, these folks felt that, well, there's, there's got to be something more going on than just that, you know, humans are basically like animals, um, except we also have a couple extra things we can do. Uh, and these theorists are sometimes referred to as eudaimonistic utilitarians. And again, this is a fancy word from my half-remembered ancient Greek. Eudaimonia is usually translated as, as happiness or sometimes flourishing. Um, where the happiness involved is not just a pleasurable psychological state. We sometimes use happiness to mean some sort of pleasurable psychological state. Uh, on the eudaimonistic view, happiness is involved with um, having pleasures, having a pleasant life, but a pleasant life that is specifically human, that embodies some ideal of human good. <clears throat> so on this view, uh, Mill understood this as having higher and lower pleasures. So on this view, well, yes, there's, there's nothing wrong with the pleasure of eating delicious, scrumptious vegan hot dogs. Uh, yeah, but it's not the same as the pleasure of intellectual reflection. Pleasures of intellectual reflection, even if they're less intense, take precedence over bodily pleasures, especially. Um, now, of course, the, the drawback to this, especially for we moderns who are skeptical of elitism, uh, the drawback to this is that it can be contentious to define what the higher and lower pleasures are are. Um, I might say that, uh, you know, all music is a higher pleasure. And you might say, no, 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 no. All music except for Rebecca Black is a higher pleasure. There, there's something wrong with pop music. That, that, that's lower in bass. Um, and you, know, you get into all sorts of fairly intractable debates about higher and lower pleasures on this kind of model doesn't mean that it's it's a fatal flaw, but it is a, a difficulty that eudaimonistic utilitarians need to grapple with. Um, and again, actually, this, this does come up in policy. This might seem kind of abstract, but if you are arguing about whether the uh, National Endowment for the Arts, A, ought to fund anything, or B, you know, ought to fund Robert Mapplethorpe's photography alongside of the opera, well, you're treading on this ground of higher and lower pleasures that the eudaimonistic utilitarians uh, were very concerned with. Okay. If you want to be a little bit more democratic, but you share the skepticism about just looking at pleasures, uh, another popular view is to say it's preference satisfaction. Now, preference satisfaction theories say that utility is the number and intensity of preferences that are, of someone's preferences that are satisfied. This has a couple of advantages that may not be immediately obvious if you, if you haven't been worried about this. 
One is that it does democratize the picture of the eudaimonistic uh, utilitarian. It allows for there to be differences in pleasures without having there to having there have to be some sort of independent universal standard of which pleasures are better and which pleasures are worse. I might gain in terms of sort of how much of an internal frisson it gives me an equal amount of pleasure from eating a scrumptious vegan hot dog and uh, understanding some subtle philosophical argument. But I might have a stronger preference for understanding philosophical arguments or a stronger preference for helping people uh, than I do for uh, hot dogs. Helping people is actually a great example. Um, if we give money to charity, the immediate feeling of pleasure that we get from giving the money might actually be less than the pleasure we get from some kind of uh, bodily pleasure, right? It might actually be less than eating a hot dog to give money to charity. And this would possibly cause a little bit of a puzzle for our actions, right? If you think if you think just in terms of pleasure, you would say, well, why would anyone give money to charity rather than buying more hot dogs? And the answer might be that I, I have a stronger preference for helping people out than I do for hot dogs. That's what, that's what makes the difference. The other issue that this can solve, and that's actually a little bit related to the issue of helping, helping distant others, uh, is that there can be certain puzzles about what to do about things that people care about that don't directly affect their lives. So take, for example, the issue of dying wishes. Um, if I tell my family that after I die, I would like half of my assets to be given to Doctors Without Borders, should they care? A hedonistic utilitarian, or even a eudaimonistic utilitarian, has a little bit of a problem explaining why they ought to care. I mean, we intuitively tend to think that dying wishes have some sort of force. Um, a preference satisfaction utilitarian doesn't. A preference, satis a preference satisfaction utilitarian can say, look, after Professor Levine is dead, he can neither gain pleasure nor suffer pain from any decision about what you do with his assets. Um, however, his preferences can still be satisfied or unsatisfied. Because I can have preferences about all sorts of things that are beyond my scope of experience. Um, another example that's often brought up on, a, on a, more, a more personal level would be something like, uh, am I harmed, is my good lessened by things that I would not want to happen but that I don't know about? Right? If my wife is having a completely secret affair that I am never aware of and changes in no way her activities towards me, a hedonistic utilitarian might seem to be in the position of having to say, well, then, then no, one's, no one's harmed. In fact, it might even be good. You know, presumably she's having the affair because she wants to and gets pleasure from doing it. And if I take no pain, uh, then, then hey, what's the problem? Preference satisfaction utilitarians can capture better our intuition that yes, things that I don't know about can in fact harm me. That this is a, you know, my wife's secret affair is a bad thing to do to me, even if I never find out about it. And again, these are uh, personal kinds of examples, but they have policy implications as well. Uh, if you worry about preference satisfaction, you might have a different picture, for instance, of um, the gay marriage debate, or in general, the debate about homosexuality. One very typical move in the repertoire of people who defend uh, gay marriage or defend legalization of homosexuality is to say, look, it doesn't affect you, right? If you don't like homosexuality, no one is going to make you go be homosexual, so let people do what they want. Um, and especially if people are doing it in private, privacy of course being a very important uh, political concept here in the US. Preference satisfaction utilitarians might be able to incorporate or might feel compelled to incorporate those kinds of preferences even more. Right? They might think that well, the, the preferences of homosexuals to be able to uh, be openly homosexual might, might be more important 
But preference satisfaction utilitarians might have to say, well, we have to count the preferences of the people who don't want there to be homosexual sex, even homosexual sex that they, they don't participate in and don't know about. Okay. And then the last, uh, and if you've, if you've been paying attention in your Econ 101 class, you will recognize the connection with preference satisfaction utilitarianism. The last is uh, economic utilitarianism, for lack of a better term, cost-benefit analysis. On this kind of economic understanding, utility is basically wealth. Utility is money. Uh, we know how much utility is created by some decision by looking at how much wealth is generated relative to the alternatives. Now, given that we typically understand preferences in economic terms in terms of willingness to pay, these might almost seem to be the same thing. The big difference is that willingness to pay is conditioned on how much money you have. Strength of preferences is not. So you can imagine preference satisfaction utilitarianism as essentially being something like cost-benefit analysis if we all have the same amount of money to start with. Okay, so major varieties of utilitarianism. The other way in which utilitarian theories uh, sometimes differ from each other is uh, on the role of rules in the system. The most straightforward kind of utilitarianism is what's called act utilitarianism. Pardon me. So what's called act utilitarianism, which is uh, largely the way that I've been talking about it so far. Act utilitarians judge each act based on its consequences, the consequences of that individual act. So if you're an act utilitarian and you are faced with the question, you know, do we uh, kill this person? Do we torture this person? Do we steal from this person? Do we tax this person? The question will always turn on what kind of outcomes are brought about by that individual act. Rule utilitarians take a slightly different approach. Rule utilitarians say, well, what kind of rules are there that if we followed them in the long run overall, typically we would get the best outcomes? So a rule utilitarian could say, look, uh, the question is not, do we kill this person right here? The question is, is this person the kind of person that we have a rule that tends to increase utility would tell us to, that would, t would tell us that it's okay to kill them or that it's obligatory to kill them? Rule utilitarians have two advantages. On the one hand, they have a little bit easier time capturing a lot of people's intuitions. And at the end of the day, you want your moral theory to probably capture most people's intuitions. You don't want it to seem crazy. And the idea that um, a policymaker might say, well, you know, we figured out that um, killing the students in Professor Levine's Moral Dimensions class for some sort of bizarre, arbitrary reason will in fact make everyone in the society better off. Uh, let's go do it. That, that, seems, um, that seems bizarre and wrong and evil to a lot of people. Rule utilitarians can say, well, yes, the reason why it seems bizarre and wrong and evil is that what we should focus on is the rule. Don't kill anyone unless they are a enemy soldier in a war or have committed a capital offense or it's self-defense, right? You've got three or four kinds of exceptions to your don't kill anyone rule. Um, and of course, you know, even if in this particular case, it seems like we ought to kill them, uh, you know, follow the rule. The other advantage besides just capturing our, our intuitions that rule utilitarians have, and the other thing that they will often claim for their theories is to say, well, if your practice was to make decisions based on each individual act, that practice would typically not lead to the greatest overall utility for two reasons. One is that people are stupid. Um, people are stupid and people are tempted to do things uh, that they would like to do uh, and so will be biased in their decision making. So the rule utilitarian will say, yeah, it might seem like there are cases where torturing people would be a good idea. 
these not people in general, but this individual torturing this guy, this individual person right here would be a good idea. But the rule utilitarian will say, but 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 people are stupid. If you find yourself in the position where you're saying torturing this guy would probably lead to the best outcome, you probably should ask yourself, am I just angry at this guy? Do I just think this guy is the kind of person that, you know, I just want to do harm to? And you should also think to yourself, what are the chances? What are the chances that torture is almost always wrong? Huge numbers of situations where it's clearly wrong. Huge numbers of situations where I clearly want to condemn torture. But I, I have suddenly found myself in one of the extremely rare and exceptional cases in which it's okay. A rule utilitarian will say, well, you should probably consider the possibility that you have not. You've just made a really bad calculation. The other problem is that if you stop to calculate this all the time, uh, you won't get anything done. Most of us live our lives without calculating the outcomes of our acts. And in fact, the act utilitarian is to some extent committed to the idea that this is not a good way to live your life. Um, remember, there's no inherently moral rules for the utilitarian. It's all about consequences. It might be the case that for some bizarre set of circumstances, uh, taking an extra five minutes to linger over my coffee this morning will lead to some horrible outcome. You know, uh, I, I, I'll linger over my coffee and as a result, I uh, am in a car accident with my daughter and I wouldn't have been in that car accident if I'd left five minutes earlier. The act utilitarian is committed to the view that this could be a wrong, this could make my drinking of the coffee wrong. Right? We might not blame me for it, that's a slightly different sort of thing, but you know, I would have to say in retrospect, wow, I didn't know that that was a wrong thing to do, but it was in fact a wrong thing to do. As a result, the rule utilitarian will say, the act utilitarian can make it sound as if we need to spend a lot of time thinking about the consequences of all of our actions, when that would just not be a way you could live your life. You will actually bring about more good in the world if most of the time, you just do the things that are usually good. You usually you don't worry too much about how long you spend drinking your coffee, and you also worry a lot usually about whether or not you should kill someone. Okay, the big problem with the rule utilitarian is uh, what's often called uh, rule fetishism. The act utilitarian can say, yeah, that all sounds really, really nice. Um, and yeah, sure probably most of the time we should go with the gam you know it might actually be utilitarianly justified to go with the gamble that five extra minutes of your coffee doesn't make that much of a difference um, or to go with the hunch that if you think torturing someone's a good idea more likely you've made a mistake than that torturing them is actually a good idea but in cases where it is clear for whatever reason, you do know that violating the rule in this particular case will lead to the better outcome. Uh, do you follow the rule or not? If the rule utilitarian says, yes, you follow the rule, then the act utilitarian will say, you're, you're fetishizing the rule. This rule was supposed to just be a way of getting us to better utility, and now you're saying we need to follow the rule even when it does not lead to better utility. Um, on the other hand, if they say, well, no, you drop the rule in that case, the act utilitarian will say, well, then you're just an act utilitarian. You're just making the reasonable point that we should have some rules of thumb because life is complicated, people are stupid, there's only so many hours in the day. Okay. Again, neither of these is necessarily an absolutely fatal blow to the theory. A lot of what I'll be talking about as we go through various theories is just understanding what the costs are, what the problems are, what you have to commit yourself to if you take one view rather than another. And this is a lot of the reason why people, reasonable people disagree about these theories, is that to some extent at the end of the day, the way you think about morality and the way you think about the basis for policy decisions fundamentally has a lot to do with what kinds of bullets are you happiest biting? What kinds of problems do you think are the least problematic, are the ones that are most reasonably solvable? And it's not that there's no answer to these kinds of questions. Uh, it's just that they're hard to answer. And there's often no answer that is completely, obviously right, knocked down, satisfying. All right.
So, <clears throat> talked a lot about what utilitarianism is, what kinds of variations on utilitarianism there are out there. But you guys are in moral dimensions of public policy, not moral dimensions of talking about philosophy for hours on end. So, why should policymakers be utilitarians? If you're going to go out there in the policy world, why should you concern yourself with this and why should you take this perspective um, when you're making your decisions? Well, a bunch of reasons. The first one is that policymakers wield power. This is the fundamental issue for the morality of policy. As a policymaker, you're going to wield power. You might be a mid-level analyst for the GAO, but you still wield some power. The reports you write will, will influence what decisions get made. And at the end of the day, you're part of a system that can get people killed, take their money, give them medicine that they might need to survive or withhold that medicine, uh, you know, increase or decrease violence in cities, increase or decrease economic equality, um, increase or decrease the chances that someone has to succeed and have a satisfying life. It's a lot of power behind policy decisions and that policy power needs to be wielded responsibly. And one of the advantages of utilitarianism is it seems to give you a pretty clear justification for why you might make decisions that harm people. Whatever level of policy you end up as, if you have any influence over what happens, if you are not, for instance, a philosophy professor, you will occasionally make decisions that harm people. Not every decision is going to be good for everyone individually. Utilitarianism gives you a ready-made answer that you can, you can give to anyone who wants a justification for why they were harmed by the decision. Utilitarians can say, look, you were harmed, but you were harmed for the greater good. You were harmed because overall, the policy that harmed you was the best one for everybody involved. Okay. It treats everyone equally. Uh, most of us, most of you, probably at least have some concern for this. At least within the American context, this is a huge concern. Uh, if you accept the view that people are moral equals, not everyone is equally good, but that everyone is deserving of equal moral consideration, the fact that utilitarianism is fairly radically egalitarian is probably a, a good thing. Um, as Kimlicka mentions, to some extent, the history of political thought, at least basically democratic political thought, can be read as a history of arguments about what it means to treat people equally. And utilitarianism treats people equally in a fairly straightforward sense. All that matters is how much overall utility is generated. It doesn't matter whose utility it is, as long as it's the greatest overall. Okay. Utilitarian theories tend to have simple and relatively uncontroversial concepts of what is good. Um, there are lots of arguments between those varieties, but on the other hand, um, utilitarians aren't talking about something abstract and metaphysical like respect for the moral law or conformity to the will of God or anything like that. They're talking about things that, while it might seem odd to try to reduce everything in the universe to it, people, there's a broad amount of agreement that things are, that these things are good, right? Even things like cost-benefit analysis, right? People like money. Most people, if you say, well, look, which is better, more money or less money? They'll say, well, you know, more money. Um, people like pleasure. Uh, you might find the odd ascetic who thinks that pleasure is bad in and of itself. But for the most part, if people have objections to pleasure, it's objections to the cost of obtaining the pleasure, uh, which, you know, the hedonistic utilitarians will put that into the calculus. Um, but you're not going to find a lot of people who are going to say, no, 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 pleasure is not good. Promoting pleasure is not a good thing. Utilitarians will often claim that their, uh, their theory gives you a calculable concept of the good that you can use. This is strongest for the cost-benefit analysis 
uh, varieties of utilitarianism. The cost-benefit analysis people will often claim as a virtue of their approach to assessing policy that, look, we can show you the numbers. We can, we can do the math and we can show you that um, protecting these wetlands leads to the greatest economic benefit overall. Um, other kinds of utilitarianism, it's a little bit harder to measure this, but the idea is that it's at least in principle calculable. We don't have a market for pleasure, but we all understand the concept of one pleasure being greater than another, and we all are at least in principle capable of understanding what it would mean to compare two pleasures, to say, you know, uh, which is more pleasure, the pleasure from eating a scrumptious vegan hot dog, or the pleasure from understanding a complex mathematical theory and comparing them that way and perhaps toting them up. And finally, utilitarianism has a particular kind of attraction for policymakers. In our everyday life, it might seem that the way to be good is to follow the rules um, that are laid down. The way to be good is to don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. That might seem more attractive for our personal dealings with other human beings than they are for than they are from the policy perspective. From the policy perspective, if you're responsible for a large number of people, if you're responsible for some segment of a society, then it seems it sounds fairly plausible to a lot of people that the way you should discharge that responsibility is by working for their common good. Um, not by worrying about your individual relationship with anyone in that group. And this generates um, the plausibility of the dilemma of dirty hands that uh, Walzer talks about. Uh, this idea that when you, when you are in charge in some sense, whether you're in charge in charge, you're the president, you're the prime minister or whatever, or whether you're at a lower level of being in charge, that you have a special responsibility to look at the good of, peop of the people over whom you exercise responsibility as a whole. All right. If all there were, of course, were reasons for people to be utilitarians, this would be an extremely short class and I would not get paid. So why shouldn't policymakers be utilitarians? You may notice that philosophers have not all settled on the idea that people should be utilitarians, so why do people say that they shouldn't? What will the rest of this class be about? Well, there's a number of issues that people have raised. One is that utilitarianism can seem in a kind of perverse way to make utility more important than people. People for the utilitarian, and this is in some sense the fundamental sin of utilitarianism for most of its detractors, People matter only as bearers of utility. Uh, and this inverts our normal moral perspective, right? Take something like pleasure. Intuitively, we often think, well, you know, if pleasure is good, it's because I like pleasure. My pleasure is good because it's good for me. But that's not really the utilitarian perspective. Me, I, I'm just a vessel for pleasure. I'm like the cup that pleasure comes in. We don't care about the cup. We only care about the pleasure. Um, and this can seem to be an offensive way to, to treat people as mere bearers of utility. One of the ways this manifests, uh, and John Rawls, who we will talk about some more uh, later, was a, 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 had a great concern with this, is that it, utilitarianism can seem to trample the boundaries between people. Um, if all we care about is utility, we don't care about the individual people, uh, it doesn't much matter if you take some utility away from me and give it to somebody else. In fact, that might be exactly the right thing to do uh, if you'll be able to get greater aggregate utility. Um, and it's often quite plausible to, to do that. Um, if you take some of my money away and give it to someone much poorer than me, even if I have nothing to do with them being poor, you may very well increase utility just because a dollar is going to be worth a lot more to a very poor person than it is to a relatively okay uh, financially person like me or like probably many of you in the class. It also seems to trample on 
the things that make us who we are. Things like personal attachments and projects. So for instance, um, most of us think that family attachments are morally fine, if not morally obligatory. If I were to say to you, um, you know, I had started saving up for my daughter's college education, but then I realized that greater utility could be served if I took all of that money and gave it to starving children in the developing world. Some people might have a kind of grudging admiration for that, but more people would be likely to think that I am kind of a moral monster for doing that. I haven't done some great saintly thing, even if they agree that greater overall happiness is created by this. right? I haven't done some great saintly thing by doing this. I've, in fact, violated a, an important moral obligation to care for my daughter because she's my daughter. Utilitarians seem to demand that the fact that she's my daughter be of no consideration. Um, all that I should consider is which child in the world can I help most with my resources? If there's any consideration that I can give to my daughter, it's purely secondary. It would flow from something like, well, I'm probably better placed to know what she needs than I am placed to know what some child in um, DR Congo needs. You know, but that's a in a lot of ways a fairly weak defense. On the one hand, it seems to get the order of explanation wrong. A lot of people would say, um, this is still not the way we ought to think about our personal attachments. It's not that I should care about my daughter because it happens to be that I have better knowledge of my daughter than I do of other, of other random people. And on the other hand, it may not actually get us our intuitions out of this, right? Um, Globally speaking, university professors in the U.S. are pretty wealthy. You know, we, we don't make out like Donald Trump, but we, we do okay. I could probably waste a huge amount of the resources that I gave away and still make people better off because there are people who are so much worse off than I am. You know, if I gave money to help folks in some of the poorest areas of the world, it might be that 90% of what I gave could be completely wasted, and yet that 10% could still do more good for them than the 100% would do for me or for my daughter or someone who already has a lot of advantages. Um, so to the extent that people think that these kinds of personal projects and attachments are valuable or at least permissible, utilitarianism doesn't seem to leave much room for that. We ought to just be looking from the bird's eye view all the time. Uh, from the policy perspective, this can arise as well. Uh, on the one hand, utilitarianism can be fairly attractive from a policy perspective. On the other hand, utilitarianism's egalitarianism is, is quite radical. Uh, many utilitarians would say, well, look, if you're willing to take the perspective of the person who is responsible for the entire nation and make decisions that are going to affect everyone in the nation and maximize good over an entire country like the United States, why not take the global perspective, right? Why, why count people in the United States more than people somewhere else? And of course, this is not the way that policymakers typically think of things. Uh, you know, typically we think that well, it makes perfect sense for Barack Obama to to some extent, care more about what happens to Americans than anyone else. You know, we might say, well, he shouldn't not care at all about what happens to other people, but some kind of preference is often acceptable. Okay. Utilitarianism is often accused of being way too demanding. Remember the Depeche Mode CD? Well, the way that most of us live our lives, uh, and again, us, the people who are likely to be listening to this, <clears throat> is almost certainly not utility maximizing. Even if you give money to charity and otherwise do things that are pretty, that, that are um, recommended by utilitarianism, chances are you could give more 
uh, without ending up sort of overcompensating. The pure utilitarian perspective seems to imply that we should give away our resources of time, of money, of material goods until the point at which we would be worse off than the people that we are trying to help. You know, that we would start destroying utility by giving it away rather than increasing it. And for most of us, um, that's a fairly radical demand. You can be pretty sure that any time you, in the current world at least, any time you buy a luxury item, uh, you probably are getting less pleasure from it than you could create for somebody else by giving them necessities. As long as there are people in the world who do not have the necessities for a satisfying life, um, who do not have uh, you know, adequate medical care, adequate food, adequate water, chances are if you buy a television set, if you buy a Depeche Mode CD, if you buy a uh, car, um, if you buy new pants when you still have at least one pair of pants that you can still wear, you are not maximizing utility. And some people think this is this is just clearly a morally implausible kind of picture of our obligations. We are not required to give our things away until the point at which we are impoverished. Okay, the other kind of implausibility sometimes people accuse it of is that the whole idea that there's a monist account of value, and this is again, this is an attack on utilitarians, there are other kinds of consequentialists we can talk about who do not fall afoul of this, that there's some single standard, whatever it is, to which um, all goods and evils can be reduced, in terms of which all goods and evils can be understood. This is possibly easily, e most easily leveled against the cost-benefit analysis version of utilitarianism, where people will say, look, not you can't slap a monetary value on everything. Think, for instance, of the hue and cry that is often raised whenever it turns out that um, some policy decision is being made because there is a finite value put on human life, right? If you're doing cost-benefit analysis of certain things, you need to put a monetary value on human life. You can't slap human life into your calculation always as infinite dollars. At least not, if you do that, you do it on pain of you will end up spending potentially infinite amount for any kind of reduction in uh, danger to human life. So when you do cost-benefit analysis, you slap a number on human life. If you say human life is worth $8 million, well, it turns out that if you have a choice of two policy options and one policy option means that uh, an extra person will die, but you'll be able to give out $8 million worth of Depeche Mode albums, hey, turns out that you should buy the Depeche Mode albums and let the person die. And a lot of people find that just fundamentally, not just morally offensive, but morally implausible that you could count that up. It's, it's not that they think, well, $8 million isn't enough, right? It's not that they say, well, no, I mean, $8 million worth of Depeche Mode albums, that's clearly not worth a human life, but $16 million worth of Depeche Mode albums, now we're talking. The idea is that you should not be putting a number on this in the first place. But the problem is that uh, it's not just for cost-benefit analysis. You can't just say, well, the economists are monsters, but, you know, hey, we're going to be um, hedonistic utilitarians, because you run into the same problem. A hedonistic utilitarian seems committed to the view that, for instance, um, there is some number of stubbed toes that is equivalent to a human life, right? That if you could save... 10,000 people from stubbing their toe, it would be okay to let someone die. And that, to a lot of people, just seems implausible. And again, it's not the specific number. It's not that we're, we're haggling about, well, is it 10,000 toes or 12,000 toes? It's that the whole idea that there is some number of stubbed toes that is exactly as good as someone's life just seems to get the moral terrain wrong to a lot of people. And finally, utilitarianism, it's possible to create a lot of um, outcomes that seem morally bizarre to lots of people. So, for instance, uh, on utilitarian view, slavery could be justified as long as enough people were made happy by the, by, by the slavery. 
to balance out the sadness or the pain or the preference dissatisfaction of the slaves. And, you know, lots of people think that can't, that, that can't be right. Um, it can't be that the problem with slavery was that we were insufficiently uh, efficient in exploiting the slaves. And if we'd been better at it, slavery would have been fine. Um, you can create weird situations where um, uh, there are potential utility monsters, right? So one example that you see in the literature is the very happy sadist, right? The person who every time they torture someone, the pleasure they gain from the torture outweighs the pain of, you know, is more potent than the pain of the person being tortured. And it seems like in that world, hey, the moral obligation of everybody is to shovel the sadist as many victims as we can find. And again, that just seems, that seems wrong. That seems like exactly the opposite of what we, we ought to do. Um, and so utilitarianism is, is just accused of, of sometimes of creating bizarre outcomes and endorsing bizarre outcomes. And again, it's always a bit of a tension about intuitions and the theory. Ultimately, the way we create and judge our moral theories is by looking at how good of a job of explaining, systematizing, and extending the way that we think about morality does this theory do? So if the theory seems to create situations that are sufficiently bizarre or counterintuitive, many reasonable people will say, look, the theory seems to have a lot going for it, but it tells me that sometimes torturing babies is okay as long as it gets people enough Depeche Mode albums, and that's just crazy. So the theory must, must have gone wrong somewhere. All right, so let's sum things up for this lecture. First, utilitarians are people who assess policies based solely on how good the consequences are. They don't have any red line rules. There's nothing that's inherently right or wrong. All that matters is what good and what, e and what bad will come out of the decision. Different utilitarian theories define good differently. Some uh, hold that it's a matter of pleasure, some hold that it's a matter of happiness, some hold that it's a matter of satisfying preferences, and some hold that it's a matter of wealth maximization. Pros, it's a simple, or at least simple-ish, theory compared to a lot. It treats everyone equally in a really obvious way. And for policy folks, cost-benefit analysis is a fairly well-established kind of policy analysis. If you walk into your job and you, when thinking about what you ought to do about the normative uh, decision-making, if you show your bosses or your constituents a cost-benefit analysis, they will, they are likely to accept it uh, in a way that they might not accept if you say, well, this would, um, you know, save the government money while still providing services, but it would require us to do evil things. It would require us to violate rules. Um, you know, CBA is fairly well established. Cons, no obvious place for individual rights or for the respect for the individual in and of uh, him or herself. Uh, and the most obvious one is that it can justify harming a few for the good of the many. Sometimes the importance of the many over the few is seen as a uh, good thing for utilitarianism. I may be dating myself, but if, you, if you've seen Star Trek II, right, or any Star Trek, the original one, not the other crappy stuff that came later, you know, Spock walks into the nuclear core and, uh, you know, to fix the ship, save everyone at the cost of sacrificing his own life, right? When Spock does that, he seems saintly, right? He says, you know, the, the good of the many outweigh the good of the few, and then he goes and kills himself, right? And then he comes back in Star Trek Three, and, you know, things get weird. But, you know, utilitarians also apply that the same way, right? They start, they never show us the episode where, um, you know, the aliens demand that they turn over some individual member of the Enterprise for slaughter, and Spock throws them in the transporter to, to, to go be killed, and says, well, the good of the many outweighs the good of the few, right? Utilitarians make both great saintly heroes when they are being self-sacrificing, and great love-to-hate-them villains when they are talking about sacrificing other people. Uh, so, if you are not comfortable with the idea that policy might, at least sometimes, require simply sacrificing people, 
for the greater good. Sacrificing their rights, sacrificing their interests for the greater good. Um, utilitarianism may not be the theory for you. Okay, this is the end of the recorded lecture. Uh, we will, of course, discuss this more in class. There are a lot of nuances to this that even in this relatively lengthy discussion we haven't gotten into. So if you did not follow instructions and you have not read the Kimlicka, uh, please do go, do go read it. Uh, the Walzer is very interesting and touches on this, um, but in specific ways that I didn't want to include in just the kind of main spine summary of utilitarianism. So please do go read the Walzer. Um, and, you know, the Watchmen excerpt is just fun, but there are lots of nuances in the readings that are not covered here, so please do not ignore them in favor of listening to me drone on for a while. All right, I'll see you in class.